test befall the heir of all men. Finally, in response to growing public concerns about fallout and evidence from around the world of rising strontium-90 levels in human bone, the atomic powers agreed to stop atmospheric testing. All future explosions would now be carried out underground. By now, as far as Headley was concerned, it was too late and too little. I think he probably would have felt vindicated, but uh, I think the wound was so deep at the time that, that uh, it was a persistent scar, as far as Headley was concerned. The minister had stated that no fallout went over a major city in Australia, and Headley knew but it did. Headley Marston monitored six of Britain's 12 atomic tests in Australia. Two of the tests, he found, resulted in radioactive contamination of cities and grazing lands, raising the question of the long-term health consequences for people living in the fallout areas. I've been told by uh, a number of people that they remembered a cloud coming down the valley of Nantuara uh, that related to the Maralinga tests. And there's speculation, local speculation I suppose, that it may have something to do with the, what seems to be a high number of cancer deaths in our district. I would love to know, you know if there is some truth in that that story. Um, I mean, it's too late to, to save my, my late husband, I guess, but it would be nice to have some answers. Unfortunately, the epidemiology is very difficult, and it would certainly be clouded in the case of radioactive contamination by chemical contamination because of the vast amounts of chemicals which were used as well, many of them extremely carcinogenic. Where there is a very definite increase in the incidence of of anything but cancer in particular, um, if there is an event such as that which could be uh, assigned a causative role, then one has to be very, very careful not to deny the possibility that that could be so. And in fact, I think that possibility is often denied. The true impact of atomic testing on the Australian population may never be known. But the evidence that contamination did occur lies within the remnants of the Strontium-90 bone survey. The full extent of the program was astonishing. Over two decades, bones had been taken from more than 21,000 bodies, making it more than twice the size of a United Nations global survey. It was a, a very, very big business over, over 20 years, and just to think of all of those all of those samples of uh, ashed bone uh, lying there in storage and being used was, was, was something of a shock. The enormity of the bone survey raises questions about the motives of the safety committee. In particular, its driving force, Ernest Titterton. Did he have a real concern for the welfare of the population? Or could there have been either a personal or political motive? This huge survey, perhaps a thousand bones a year. I can't believe that there wasn't fear here in Titterton's heart, uh, that he was extremely concerned uh, to protect himself. One way perhaps of doing this was to go over the top in terms of uh, proving his innocence, if you like, or proving Headley of wrong. It was possible through the cooperation of the hospitals and pathologists to actually sample human bones of individuals who had died. Was there any radioactivity in any of the human bones? Yes, there's radioactivity in you and in me as we sit here. You've got loads of radium in your bones, you've got loads of potassium in your soft tissues, and you have got, as everybody else on Earth has, small amounts of materials from nuclear weapons testing carried out by the Russians, the Americans, the British, the French, and the Chinese. But the levels are so small 
that they have absolutely zero effect on you. Titterton was right in the sense when he said it would not be a major radiation hazard for the Australian population. Where he was wrong is in saying that there was no hazard. It was not the sort of thing you would expect people of their standing uh, to actually state. And uh, so those sorts of assurances were being given for political, not scientific reasons. It was not a term that was used at the time, but, but Marston was a whistleblower. He found out that lies were being told to the Australian public and he wanted to bring this to the attention of the Australian public. And for a long time, uh, he was kept away from doing that. If Headley had not had the anger he had and the convictions he had and the ruthlessness he had, he would not have won that battle. He did win it. And although he made himself very unpopular, with, both with the government and with the, certainly with the, a lot of the scientific establishment, I think he's been justified by time. It's seen the transmogrification of Headley from being a monster into with his work on the fallout from the Maralinga test being a near saint. And his latter part of his life has, I think, redeemed all his earlier grossnesses. On the day of his retirement in 1965, Headley Marston died in an Adelaide hospital. Until the end, he believed there was no safe level of exposure to radiation. Four decades later, it is still one of the most contentious arguments in science. My dear Mark, Sooner or later, the public will demand a commission of inquiry on the fallout in Australia. When this happens, <laughs> some of those boys will qualify for the hangman's news. Yours ever, Headley. <laughs>